Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. It is good to be here tonight. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 19. We are continuing in our sermon series called The Son of God. And for the remainder of 2022, our team will be preaching and teaching from the gospel of Luke. Now, if you don't have a Bible with you today, that is A-OK. We've got you covered. If you'll reach down under the seat in front of you, you can find a Bible right under the seat. Grab that Bible and you'll find Luke chapter 19 on page 1043. Now, as always, if you came today and you don't have a Bible at your home that you can read or understand easily, we invite you to take one of our Bibles home with you. They don't do any good sitting underneath the seats all week long. So take a copy of the Bible home with you. And the only thing that we ask you to do is to read it and apply it. It doesn't do any good sitting on your lampstand. Read God's word and begin to apply it to your life. At Calvary, we are firmly convinced that if we read and apply God's word, God will change our lives. Now, if you have spent any type of your life, any season of your life, investing in kids' ministry, Maybe it's vacation Bible school. Maybe it was kids Sunday school. Uh, maybe you were involved with summer camp. You might be familiar with a wee little man named Zacchaeus. If you're familiar with Zacchaeus, you may very well be familiar with the little song or the rhyme that goes a little something like this. Raise your hand if you're familiar with this. And what did Jesus say when he saw Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, what? You come down, right? So many of you are familiar with this passage. And if you're not familiar with this passage, or at least you're familiar with the childhood version of Zacchaeus. Today, we get to talk about the adult version of Zacchaeus. Instead of lumping him into this sweet, innocent, short little guy, wee little man that climbed up in a tree to see Jesus, we're going to talk about how the people viewed Jesus back then. Zacchaeus wasn't just a wee little man. Zacchaeus was a pretty terrible guy. Uh, he was not trusted by the Jewish people in fact, he was an extortionist. He was the chief tax collector. And that means that what he would do, he was in charge of all the other tax collectors in the region. Now, the Roman government worked this way. If, if, if Zacchaeus imagined that the taxes were going to be a million dollars to pay the government of Rome that he would collect that year, he would pay up front to the Roman government $1 million. Then he and his cohorts, his tax collectors that worked for him, would spend the remainder of the year trying to earn that money back from the Jewish people. And if they, if they made above and beyond, that didn't matter to the Roman government. As long as the Roman government received their million dollars up front, then they were fine with Zacchaeus and his friends charging as much money from the Jewish people as they wanted. They would make a substantial profit. Now, since the Jewish people considered the Romans uh, really occupiers, uh, occupiers in their land, they knew that the tax collectors worked for Rome, they wanted nothing to do with tax collectors, especially the chief tax collector. They were viewed as unfaithful, disloyal to the Jewish people, and a betrayer of the Jewish people. So, Zacchaeus' role and his life really didn't sit well with the Jewish people. He had betrayed them, but if the Jewish people resisted giving money to the tax collectors and to Zacchaeus, if the Jewish people said, no, 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 we are not going to give you that much money, Zacchaeus had the power of the Roman government on his side, and he would simply say, oh, you're not gonna give me money? This Roman soldier has something to say about that. 
and they would take by force the money that they wanted to take. So year after year, uh, Zacchaeus was viewed as a betrayer of the Jewish people. He was a thief protected by the Roman government and really to many of the Jewish people, he was a jerk. So let's read about this jerk, I mean Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse one. He entered Jericho and was passing through, talking about Jesus, and behold, there was a certain man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. So here's Zacchaeus. He's short, he's hated, and he is filthy rich. I I think that an important takeaway from this passage is to understand one simple truth Believe that the only thing that can prevent you from following Jesus is you. Believe that the only thing that can prevent you from following Jesus is you. Now, in order for Zacchaeus to have this encounter with Jesus, he had to overcome a couple obstacles. One, he was short. He couldn't see over the crowd. And secondly, the crowd was certainly not going to entertain Zacchaeus and say, oh, please, let's move him to the front of the line. He's such a wonderful guy. They could not have cared any less about whether or not Zacchaeus could see. So Zacchaeus tucks his robe around his waist. He takes off running, his short little stubby legs a blur. He runs to the front of the crowd and he climbs a tree. Now, when I was a child, growing up in Tennessee, growing up in Pennsylvania, I climbed a lot of trees. I climbed trees all the time. Confessionally, as a dad, I have climbed trees maybe once or twice. That's not something that adults do. Children climb trees, not adults. It was the same back then. Now, out of curiosity, if you would help me out by raising your hand, if you climb trees as a child, would you raise your hand? All right, if you climb trees as an adult for fun, raise your hand. Now, if you've spent your entire adulthood out on a limb, would you raise your hand? Zacchaeus was already despised, and now here's this short little guy, and it's the same kind of vibe that you and I would have if we saw an adult in a tree. He's this short little guy. He scampers up this tree, and I would imagine he was putting himself a little bit at risk of more ridicule. Hey, is that a little boy up there? Nope, it's Zacchaeus. I'm sure he was placing himself in an awkward position. And if you've become a follower of Jesus and you've surrendered your life to God, you know that when you began to tell other people about your decision to follow Jesus, their response to you and their response to what you said to them about how you surrendered your life to Jesus, their response might be a little bit awkward. After I gave my life to Jesus in 1991, I told my Nana and my Nana looked at me from across the table and told me that I was brainwashed. That was awkward. I I loved my grandmother. I knew that that Jesus had changed me and I couldn't believe that she responded to me that way. 
When I told the men that I worked construction with that I had given my life to Jesus, one of the guys said, ooh, now you're a fairy Jesus follower. That made things a little bit awkward. See, when I surrendered my life to Jesus, I just assumed that every other person that I would encounter would want Jesus in their life. I assumed that the change that I experienced in my heart, everybody wanted. I assumed that everybody wanted to be forgiven for their sins. I assumed that everybody wanted to have that relationship with God and they wanted to have a transformed heart. I was wrong, but I did not allow what other people thought about my decision to prevent me from continuing to follow Jesus. So let me ask you a rhetorical question. Are you allowing something else to prevent you from becoming a follower of Jesus? Are you allowing the opinions of other people to prevent you from surrendering your life to Jesus? Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe your spouse doesn't want you to be a Jesus follower. Or maybe your family doesn't want you to leave the faith that you grew up in to follow Jesus. And maybe you're concerned you'll have to walk away from, maybe it's your occupation or from hobbies that you have in your life. Maybe you're too concerned about what you might have to give up if you become a follower of Jesus. See, the only thing that can prevent you from becoming a follower of Jesus is you. Don't worry about your spouse. Don't worry about your family. Don't worry about your occupation or your hobbies. Don't worry about your past. And don't worry about your future. You are the only thing that will prevent yourself from becoming a follower of Jesus. And if If you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus today, if you believe that God created you and he wants to have a relationship with you, if you believe that sin in your own life prevents you from having that relationship with God, if if you believe that Jesus' death on the cross forgave your sin and removed the barrier between you and God, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead and will one day return, then let today be the day that you stop making excuses. Let today be the day that you stop allowing yourself to be your own stumbling block. Our prayer team will be here at the close of the service. They would love to pray with you and help you become a follower of Jesus and surrender your life to him. Now, if you're already a follower of Jesus or or maybe you'll become a follower of Jesus today, I want to challenge you, respond to Jesus by living a changed life. Respond to Jesus by living a changed life. Now, it's important to note that in the past, whenever Jesus was around those notorious sinners, or whenever Jesus was spending time with the notorious sinners, it was the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, and the Pharisees that would complain about Jesus associating with such sinful people. But in this passage, it's not the religious leaders that are complaining. It was everybody. The, the passage of Scripture says in verse 7, when they saw it, they all grumbled. Nobody liked Zacchaeus. They're starting to grumble and they said he's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. It wasn't just the religious leaders, it was everybody. And Zacchaeus, he overhears this grumbling about him and he hears them saying things like, what's this jerk doing coming to Jesus? He doesn't belong here. Uh, We don't like him. We can't believe Jesus is going to his house. And Zacchaeus understood their complaints. He understood that he had been a cheater and a betrayer and a swindler and a no good corrupt tax collector. Even the feast in his household that he was about to prepare for Jesus was going to be paid for on the backs of the Jewish people. His home, his servants, his lands, his his property, his barns. He had wealth because he had betrayed the Jewish people and took more money than he should have 
from them. But Zacchaeus' next words out of his mouth demonstrate the same type of life-changing power of Jesus that is available. He experienced the life-changing power of Jesus, and you and I are able to experience the life-changing power of Jesus today. See, he had a desire to hoard and to steal and to cheat, but that was no longer in his heart. Now, uh, Zacchaeus wanted to bless others. Now he wanted to give generously. He wanted to make up for how he had wronged other people. In verse 8, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give away to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Because of Jesus, Zacchaeus was not the same man that he had been, uh, that he was before he scampered up into that tree. At some point, Zacchaeus had placed his faith in Jesus as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. At some point, Zacchaeus was transformed. He was changed. He was made different. Even though the Jewish people hated him, he said, I'm giving half my property away to the poor. And the people that he had defrauded and the people that he had cheated, he said, look, I'm gonna give it back to them fourfold. The apostle Paul describes what happens to a person when we give our lives to Jesus, that there is something supernatural inside of us that changes our hearts that we're no longer the same person that we once were. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, anyone that belongs to Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, the new life has come. The actions of Zacchaeus demonstrates that he had been transformed from the inside out. People weren't standing around him demanding that he give the money back. He had the desire in his heart. He said, I've been changed. And now, instead of betraying the Jewish people, he had a loyalty for the Jewish people. His desire for greed was transformed into generosity. And his response to Jesus accepting him and inviting him, his response was to live a radically changed life. He was no longer the same person that he had been, and he wanted everyone to know it by his actions. So you've surrendered your life to Jesus. How are you living a changed life? The best thing that you can do is to prioritize the mission of Jesus to seek and save. That's the very best thing that you can do. Prioritize the mission of Jesus to seek and save. Jesus was very clear about his mission, his purpose in life. Whenever people criticized him for the type of people that he was hanging out with, uh, the drunks, the notorious sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the scum of the earth, whenever people criticized him, he always explained that he was on a mission to seek and save the lost. If, they, if you are a follower of Jesus, there is nothing greater that you can do than prioritize the mission to seek and save the lost people, those who are around you who don't have a relationship with Jesus. We stopped living for ourselves, and we surrendered our lives to Jesus. And when we surrendered our lives to Jesus, that meant his priority becomes our priority. His mission becomes our mission. So have you prioritized his mission for your life? H have you demonstrated that because you're now a follower of Jesus, that the priority of seeking and saving the lost is your number one priority in life. See, it's Jesus that brings hope to those who struggle in darkness. 
Words of encouragement are great, but it's only Jesus that can bring hope to those who are hurting. It is only Jesus who can bring healing to families. It is only Jesus who brings peace to those who are facing fears and anxiety and worry. It is only Jesus who is able to rescue the addict and free people from the captivity of sin. Niceness is great, but it's only Jesus that can change a life. It's only Jesus that can bring hope. And our priority as followers of Jesus is to be a part of what God is doing and make his priority our priority. As I close the message today, I wanted to share some news with you about our family uh, with the church. As we talk about the priority of Jesus and the mission of Jesus, since mid-July, Christy and I have been praying that God would open a door of ministry for us closer to family in the southeastern United States. It's not because we don't love Calvary. Uh, we love this church. It's not because we don't love the people of Havasu, because we do uh, wholeheartedly love the people of Havasu. We love you. But in September, I began prayerful dialogue with a church in South Carolina. Uh, the church has been without a lead pastor for the last 16 months. And this past weekend, Christy and I flew out to uh, South Carolina. We made an on-site visit with the church, with the staff, with the leadership team. And both my wife and I are convinced that this is the opportunity that God has opened for us. Now, I'll share more information about that church tomorrow morning uh, in our services because they'll be sharing information with their church family as well. On December 3rd and 4th, I'm going to be preaching in view of a call uh, which means through prayer, the church body in South Carolina will affirm God's calling on our lives. And, and I know that that information may come as a shock to many of you, uh, and I don't like the information to share with you either, but I know that God has opened up this opportunity, and this is where he is leading us. This is the calling that he has placed on our lives, and we want to run joyfully into that calling that he has for us. So as you've been praying for our family, as you've been praying for us, I'm gonna ask that you just continue to pray for our family. We're not fully sure of what the transition is going to look like, uh, but we are dependent upon God. We are dependent upon Jesus. We are dependent upon the prayers of our friends and of our church family, and we are dependent upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Following Jesus uh, was never described as an easy thing to do in Scripture. And as I said before, we, we love you. Uh, we care deeply for this body. We care deeply for Calvary. And uh, we also understand that we must follow Jesus and go where he opens up a door for us for opportunity. So thank you for loving on our family. Thank you for caring for us over the last four years. Uh, you guys are amazing and uh, we love you. And we're excited about the future of Calvary. We're also excited about uh, the future that God has for us as well. Let me pray. Lord, um, thank you. Thank you that you call us to follow you. And thank you that we always don't have the answer. Thank you that we don't always have uh, the solution. But we thank you, Father, that through your grace, through the leadership of the power of the Holy Spirit, you bless us, you protect us, you lead us, and you guide us. And Lord, it's our prayer that you would continue to, uh, continue to move and change people's lives here in Havasu. I thank you that you allowed us to be a part of what you've been doing over the last four years. And Lord, thank you for uh, just being faithful and opening up a, an opportunity for us in South Carolina. Lord, we love you, and we continue to commit our lives to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, before you go, Joe, we want to pray for you. Um, you prayed for us. Um, you know, there's, there's two things uh, I know for certain about Joe Donahue. Number one, uh, he wants to see people come to a, a life-changing relationship with Jesus without doubt. Number two is that family is his first ministry. And uh, as he shares this news, we want to bless them, we want to encourage them, and we want to pray for them. Would you join with me in doing that? Father, thank you that... Uh, 
we belong to you. Our lives are not our own. We've been bought with a price, and that price was the blood of Jesus. And you have redeemed us and saved us, and we serve you and you alone. And you have the right to do anything you want with our lives. And so right now, as uh, Joe has shared this, this news with uh, the body of Christ at Calvary, Lord, we commit he and Christy and the girls to you asking for your blessings, asking for your grace to fall upon them. Lord, open the doors, uh, make the way straight for them. And Lord, use them in a mighty way to lead people to life change in Jesus uh, wherever you place them, however you lead them. Uh, God, may his ministry continue to be fruitful, and may you fill him with your spirit as he goes and as he leads. Uh, Father, we thank you for the grace that you've given us and the time and the blessings that have come as the Donahues have shared here in Havasu. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Give him a hand, give him a hand. Yeah.